I don't know if you watch the Marvel Studio theatrical versions of uh, like the Avengers type thing. Do you watch these? How many know of what I'm talking about? Yes, the truly spiritual. Um, I started watching these. I don't know. When I was a kid back in the 60s, I would buy, you know, that back in the day, if you had a quarter, you could buy a comic book for 10 cents, like a soda for like a nickel in a glass bottle that was real, uh, and a candy bar for like a nickel and have change. Remember those days? Yes, I'm that old, but I remember that. So I kept all my comic books uh, from back then. Uh, I have them in, uh, encased in plastic now, hoping to sell them one day and rehire, retire to a Tahitian island. But um, So I've loved cartoons and stuff, and I used to draw and do cartoon work and stuff when I was younger. Uh, I love that. So I started watching these things. So like Iron Man in 2008, like that was awesome. Tony Stark, oh, yeah. you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, uh, Tony Stark, he's got the little heart issue, you know, heart wound, has that power plate. He, all of a sudden, he can transform into the suit of armor and fly and do amazing things. Wouldn't it be awesome to be able to do that? Uh, 2008 was also the Incredible Hulk, uh, which was not anything like Dave Bixby, Incredible Hulk, in the 70s. Radically different. Uh, there was Captain America, the first Avenger. There was Thor in 2011. In fact, there's a huge debate um, if you get online and try to ask this one question. Which one of these movies came first? There's all kinds of like intricate debate on, no, this one came here. It's unbelievable the level people get involved with. Certainly not I. Um, anyway, the, the last one that came out, I think it was this summer, was Avengers Endgame. Uh, did you see it? Yeah, you know. Now, this was, this was interesting because the, the motif of the, of the movie is Thanos is trying to zap life, you know, from the cosmos. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, the reason why I watch these things is it's a theological exercise. <laughs> it truly is. I mean, think about it. I mean, you can even do a Greek analysis of Thanos. Because Thanos comes from the Greek word thanatos, which means death. And if, and if you think about it theologically speaking, who's trying to destroy the earth with evil and darkness and death? The devil. So I can watch these things and make a spiritual application so that, go watch them. Uh, and you will see that the, they couldn't even have this movie if they didn't have a tension between good and evil, light and darkness, correct? Because the Avengers... Uh, these uh, superheroes, they have different kinds of powers to take on said evil, correct? Do you not as a Christian have certain kinds of powers that God gives you? We talked about this the other day. Spiritual gifting to take on evil and to serve God? Absolutely you do. So I would, I would say there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between those shows and you. In what way? Once you get saved, you're God's supernatural, like, superhero. Are you going with it or... Well, I'm not feeling too super, you know. Remember Captain America went in the machine as a little scrawny guy, came out buff and muscular with a six-pack. That's you spiritually. Just tell your, your wife. Anyway. <laughs> so what's that got to do with anything? Well, this is everything that Paul's talking about. Chapter 12 is about radical transformation to take on evil. I mean, if you're truly a Christian who's living sacrificially, not conforming to said culture, you know, really living for God, your life is going to radically transform that all can see, and this will push darkness back. Well, to me, that's like a transformer. That's like somebody's being transformed uh, through their, their power suit or whatever it is to do great things to push back evil. So this is Paul. So Paul is like Tony Stark, right? Just follow the analogy. He's got great powers, right? And that glowing thing in his chest is like the power of the Holy Ghost. And boom, on goes his plate of armor. Ephesians chapter 6, the armor of God. This preaches all day. <laughs> so what's chapter 12 about? Radical living that's transformed. All right? And that's what we're talking about in uh, verses 9 through 21. Last week we looked at uh, one verse. Today we're going to go for broke and go for two verses. I know, it's a hold on to your seats. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna, but we have to review because brain cells die daily. I'm trying to encourage you. Harry, what would you say? A lot, they, a lot die daily. Yeah, I'm already, by the way. If so think about this. We want to review from last week. So Paul says, if you want to live like radical to transform life as a Christian, uh, you're going to do three things, he says. Three commands. He says you're going to be radically righteous with your love, that it's going to be God kind of love, not love with contingencies and, and forms to fill out, and you've got to go through all these hoops to get my love. No, it's unconditional love. He says, be that kind of person in the dark culture in which you live. You'll push back evil. Then he said, also be radically righteous toward evil. You will shun evil. So when you see evil, you see it as evil. Call it sin, 
and you turn from it. You don't turn toward it. By the way, you might want to read Psalm chapter 1 and just circle the verbs as you read Psalm chapter 1 um, because it pictures a man walking through life and he sees sin and then he looks at sin and then he stops and sees the sin and then he sits down in the sin. Don't be that kind of man. Keep moving, keep moving. Um, then he says, lastly, if you are living radically, this transformed life to push back evil, uh, you will cling to that which is good. That's your radical nature. And I told you last week, if you were here, that the Greek word for cling to that which is good is the Greek word for glue. Remember Gorilla Glue? Were you all here or are you all new? Yeah, Gorilla Glue, or you forgot the sermon because brain cells die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's, you will cling to good. So you have to ask yourself, am, am I doing these things? Do I love like God loves? Do I truly or, and, and do I hate evil? Do I turn from evil as God does? And uh, do I really cling to that which is good and not evil? Masquerading like good. Paul's gonna add three more things today that a transformed believer is gonna be living uh, to, to be like the ultimate avenger warrior against darkness. Uh, these are things our culture needs. Number four, uh, you should be radically righteous toward what I would call is the family. The family. Notice what he says. He says, be devoted to one another in what kind of love? In the New American Standard, NAS brotherly love. Now the NIV doesn't really represent the Greek text there. It just says be, be devoted to one another in love. So, but, but in the, in the Greek text, he, when he says be devoted to each other in brotherly love, the Greek word is Philadelphia. Sounds like, Philadelphia. I mean, it sounds like Philadelphia, but that's not very hard. I mean, yeah. So, <laughs> and so I'm, I told you Greek was easy. So Philadelphia, Adelphos is the Greek word for brother, uh, phileo is the word for love, so you combine these two words. German does this, they staple words together. Uh, and you staple these two, wor two words together, so you get phileo, love, brother, love, brother, brotherly love, so, right? So does everybody in Philadelphia love each other? <laughs> you been there? Yeah, I've been there. I did a wedding there a couple of years ago for one of the guys in our church was on the Olympic rowing team, and I, so I went there to do the wedding, and uh, Liz and I cruised around downtown. Uh, carefully, you know, because uh, they haven't got the whole Philadelphia concept yet. Uh, but Paul says, when it comes to being a Christian, when you're justified by faith in Jesus, you should ipso facto have brotherly love for each other. Did you have a brother? Did you have a sister? Did you love them at all times? Eh, well, no. Yeah, I mean, if you were to interview, my, well, my one sister went home to be with Christ last year, but I still have a little sister. If you were to interview them and talk to them, was it always peace and tranquility in your home? Mm -mm. No, it was like a war zone a lot of the times. And it, they caused it. I was just a bystander, you know? <laughs> you know? But I mean, at the end of the day, when you get older and you're in your 20s and 30s and beyond, you kind of look back at the crazy things you used to do to each other. And you're like, I loved you anyway. I mean, I still love you. You know what I'm saying? And it's so, like, I didn't say this in the other services, but it's too appropriate. It's like when my sister Marla went to college at Azusa Pacific and I'm left with my little sister, six years younger, and she's scared to death of... of uh, <laughs> of Jaws, the movie, boom, 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 that whole thing. So I recorded that off of a record I had onto a cassette player, and I taught <laughs> brotherly love. So I, 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 I recorded that record of that, doom, 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 that whole thing, and I slid it under her bed that night because she was going to be in the bedroom by herself for the first time without Marla. <laughs> I'm a big girl. I can do it. I got you. So I slid my cassette player under the bed. I had it all timed. I went in there. It was the funniest thing. They turned all the lights out. She must have had 40 little animals around her face for protection. I went in my bedroom. I laid down. It's quiet. You know, my dad wasn't working shift work at that day, and he was home. And I, pretty soon I heard the dun, 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 dun. I'm like, this is awesome. She starts screaming. My parents run in there. What in the world? Where's that noise coming from? It's under the bed. So my dad comes in my room. Marty, come here. <laughs> <laughs> I terrorized her, but I loved her. You know? So Paul says, hey, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, which means you should really show that you love them, right? Right? Now, Liz knows that I have a lot of relatives, do I not? Yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable. And because my family's all from South Carolina, we, we call them, it's a Greek word, it's monosyllabic. We call them kin. <laughs> I have a lot of kin. Uh, and so Liz and I were married for 13 years, and I keep telling her, she had three cousins. That's it. I don't even know all my cousins. And so we go to South Carolina. Oh, you had two cousins. See? 
What are you saying to me? You, oh, you have two living cousins. One died? You only had two? Oh, wow. <laughs> Who am I? It's less than what I thought it was. But, so anyway, she had two cousins. Okay, so yeah, really. Brain cells ideally. Thank you. <sighs> Interactive sermon. I don't think you've ever spoken in a sermon. That's amazing. Anyway, <laughs> I got to move on quickly here. My marriage is at stake. So, <laughs> so, so, so here's, so if you're new, I have to explain my family to you. So my, my family's from South Carolina. They've been there since the 1700s. So my, my grandma Lily was one of 16 children. Her husband, my grandpa Whiteford, he was one of 10. Just they among themselves had 11 children. My dad and 10 sisters, which I've told you when the Korean War came along, I know why he joined the U.S. Navy. He kept telling me, it's for patriotism. I'm like, you just want a bathroom without 10 girls to like bust in, in, right? But anyway, my dad was funny. We had a good time with him. But they never moved from that little southern town. And then when my dad got out of the war out in San Francisco in Treasure Island, he stayed in California. Now, how many relatives were there? I mean, a stream of them. So after 13 years of marriage, we go back to this little southern town, which I still have my relatives living there. She goes with us with the kids. After about a week of people constantly streaming in, Ken, all day long, guys are out on the back patio, you know, porch way, you know, talking, drinking Coke, whatever. All, tons of people. She finally looked at me at one point and she's like, who are these people? Because it was new people every day for two straight weeks. I'm like, well, these are my kin folk. One thing's indicative about all of them. Uh, I loved all of them. All about them. They all had their issues. But I still love those kin folk because they're family, right? Because by definition, if you are part of a family, you, you should love your family, right? I mean, that's a natural thing. And, and, and so Paul says, think about it. You should have brotherly love towards your family members. You have to ask yourself, do you? I mean, think about the guy across the aisle from you right now. If, that, if that's a brother in Christ, you should be going, man, I, I love that family over there. Not, they're in my seat. <laughs> Trust me, this has happened in here before. Do you realize who's sitting in my chair? Is like your name on it? But that's just where I sit. God knows. But a brother in Christ has taken your chair. What should you be thinking? Oh, I love him, right? I love him. See, if you are truly one who loves your brother, then you will not care about what happens. Like you, will you share your possessions with a brother in Christ? Well, it depends. I got to pray about it. Mm, no, you should probably share. Um, uh, uh, if you have a brother in Christ, uh, you won't be easily offended by them. Why? To use the Greek surfing language, that's your bro. Do you follow me? Hey, I didn't know bro was Greek. I'm just fooling around with the word. That's my bro. So do you hate your bro? No. Do you get upset at your bro? Yeah, yeah, but then you work things out, you hug, you, you know, etc. cetera. Um, if your bro needs some financial assistance, what do you do? Hey, bro, this is really bad that's happened to you, man. Be warm and be fed and uh, let me know if you get your act together. No, what do you do? If it's a somebody in your family, you financially help them, right? Who has given money here to family members never to see it again? <laughs> yeah, I have. Yeah. So every time that you give this money to family members who have a need, every time you meet, meet them, do, do you bring this up? Yeah, this is a really great hamburger. By the way, where's my money? <laughs> yeah, I know we're grilling these steaks right now, but I just kind of wonder, like, where's my money? Do you ask about it? No, why? It's your bro. So you help your brothers. And so Paul says, hey, at the top of the list, make sure that you're devoted to each other in brotherly love. The greatest thing that could be said about a church is that it has love for each other. That's the greatest thing. Uh, I know that because Paul talks about it in first, the first Thessalonians chapter four, right into the Thessalonian church. Notice what he says to him. Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, excel more. Hmm. So are we a loving church? Well, yeah, kind of. Are we a loving church? I, I, I'm convinced. It's a loving church. Uh, could we love more? Sure. Absolutely. And so, so what we need to do is say, we're like Thessalonica. Paul said, hey, you've got love about you, but, but you can always improve. Uh, in our said culture, what is the culture looking for? But people who truly love each other, no conditions. Second, Paul says, radical living 
is uh, not just loving your family members, but honoring family members. Notice what he says. Be devoted to each other in love and then do what? Well, uh, NAS says to give preference to one another in honor. And the NIV says, honor one another above yourselves. This is really hard because we are a very uh, pampered society. Are we not? I mean, I was in a shopping mall one day walking by one of those nail places with the chairs you can get your toes done and everything. You know what I'm talking about? The place the guy will not look into. And I'm walking by there and I'm like kind of looking who's in there. And there's this big football type dude in a chair with some lady working on his toes. And I'm like, what in the world? This is a pampered world, is it not? You go to the, you go to the, go to the airport. They got massage stuff right out in the middle of the open. I'm not going there. Everybody's walking by. It's pastor. Let's get a massage right here, man. He must have had a rough week. I mean, but <laughs> this is a pampered world. What does Paul say to those kind of people? He says, well, you need to remember to honor other people more than yourself because we are super into ourselves. Check out people's Instagram. I mean, they're telling you where they went in a given day, what they saw, what they ate. Do you care? I mean, my wife showed me some of that stuff. And I've tried several times on my iPhone to add Instagram, and it always kicks it off. and won't load on my phone. I think it's God. But she keeps showing me, just check this out. She's like, they had a tostada today at lunch. <laughs> Does it matter? It's unbelievable. It's always it's about me. It's totally about me. I'm like, you need to come to church. So what does Paul say? Uh, no, you need to give preference to one another. It's very hard because we're very egocentric. We want people to, I mean, my, that I posted that, it went viral. I'm famous now. No, Paul says, no, you need to put people above you. Now, what's interesting is the Greek word here for giving preference. It's the Greek word to lead the way, quote, to lead the way, unquote. Now, we had a big argument about this in the first service. <laughs> Which military group claims that as their title? We lead the way. Is it the Navy? Coast Guard? Mm, is it the Marine Corps? Mm, no. Well, I've had many Marines tell me in the last two services, they'll educate you quickly. Um, Marines, we are first to fight. True? Do we have any Marines here? Thank you. They all, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your service. So the Marines are first to fight, true or false? <laughs> it's false. The Navy say it's false. Yeah, whatever. Okay, I was educated by the Army. A couple of officers came up to me and told me, hey, Rangers, lead the way. In fact, I was told by an Army Ranger, sometimes Marines go to Army Ranger School. This is an interesting church. <laughs> yeah. So what's this got to do with my sermon? Everything, that's the Greek word. I mean, this is where the army got this. It, trying to help you right here. It, you got to lead the way. So what's that mean? Lead the way in honor, which means you see something awesome in another Christian's life, you know, you should lead the way in honoring them. Well, like case in point. You see, uh, Darren, it's his last Sunday. He's going to be moving to Texas. We, we need to honor him. We're going to honor him today at 1 o'clock, by the way, with a luncheon thing. Uh, but you see, uh, Darren or somebody playing on the team, they're doing a great job. You, you go honor them. Don't send your wife. Hey, baby, could you go up there and just kind of tell me you did a great job today? Huh? You do it yourself. I mean, don't send your three kids up there. Mommy, Daddy, want you to go up there and tell them it was just awesome today. Why, Mommy? Well, it's a spiritual thing to do. You know, that, that type of thing. No, but he says, honor one another above yourselves. Think about it this way. You, your child goes out for the football team. They don't make the team. And another Christian family, their Christian son goes out for the football team he makes the team. What do you do? You celebrate them, don't you? So if you're the young man, you go up to that young man and you didn't make the team, you tell him, hey man, I just want to honor you all day long as a brother in Christ. And next year, I'm taking your position. <laughs> no, no, you go and you honor them. You honor them. So I'm just telling you, it, look for opportunity to honor other Christians, not yourself. You should constantly be looking because it's a present tense command in Greek. You're constantly looking for putting other people ahead of you, honoring them. And then notice what he, what he says. Lastly, he says, uh, be radical about how you function as a Christian. Be radical how, how you function. Well, like what? He says three things. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, and serving the Lord. Those three things should be your functioning. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, 
let's analyze the first part of how we should function. He says, uh, no sloths, no slackers, no laggers, and a whole bunch of other words. Don't, don't, don't be that way. This is the first thing. Not lagging behind in what? Diligence. Uh, what's diligence? Well, diligence means uh, I am going to stay on task until, set, set, until that task is done. You can count on me. I mean, I am going to finish that task. I'm going to complete that task because I am diligent. He says, don't be a lagger. Have you ever worked with somebody who is a lagger? Maybe it's you, a slacker. When I got out of the PhD program early because uh, of Nathan's uh, special needs with autism that he had, mild autism. So I, I got a job. I, I, I was going to be a professor, not, I needed, but I needed a job. So I got a job in a, in a paper uh, company uh, loading trucks 15,000 pounds to 20,000 pounds a day we picked up each man and loaded on pallets and then put them into trucks it was it I would walk home, go home dead tired uh, and so there was about a hundred thousand square foot square foot warehouse and we had one guy that constantly disappeared we're like where did he go I don't know man he's like in the warehouse somewhere somebody go find that guy we're over here stacking all these boxes so one day we finally located him what he did is he took his forklift and he moved pallets out of paper products that we stacked high to, to pick from. And he had built a bed in there. I kid you not. I like those Costco rack things. He moved the stuff out and built a bed in there so nobody, nobody could see him, stacked the boxes really high, and he was taking a siesta. We educated him quickly about the Christian way. <laughs> diligence, diligence. Paul says there shouldn't be anybody at, at, in the body of Christ who's not diligent. You know, so which means, you know, when you get an opportunity to work, you work. You don't just watch people work. Well, I feel I'm diligent as I'm diligently watching other people serve. Uh, no. Did you see that movie Zootopia? <laughs> I spend my time watching cartoons, basically. Yeah. Did you see this? How many saw this? Is this not funny? Again, spiritual instruction. You know, I'm watching this thing and I'm going, that is so Pauline. You know, what? Pauline. Paul. So, you got that little rabbit coming up to the DMV. There's a sloth behind the counter. A little fox is sitting there. And they walk up, need some work done. And it's kind of a spoof on, does the DMV move quickly? Answer, no, you, you can have a birthday there. You know, and so, so, the little, so the little rabbit goes up there and, you know, says, uh, hi, would you like to hear a joke? You know, and like, well, you know, what do you call a camel with three humps? And so he's telling this little joke. And that sloth is like, Yes. And it's like everything is just like slow motion. Uh, and then the little, the little rabbit and the fox are about ready to pull their hair out because the sloth's going so slow. And then after the joke is done, like 30 seconds later, then the sloth laughs like in slow motion. And then the sloth turns to the next sloth at the next window and says, want to hear a joke? And it's like, oh my, get with the program. I, I give this to you because that is the opposite of the word diligent. So what's this mean? Well, you signed up to serve in our ministry fair, you know, the other day, and you put your name down to serve. If you're diligent, and you signed up at, say, 1030, then by 1 o'clock, you're already calling Tammy. Hey, what's up? I signed up. When do I get plugged in? If you're not diligent, you're waiting for them to call you. See? No, a diligent person stays with the program. They don't have to follow you up. Now, diligent. You fervent that way? And then he also says, you should also be fervent in spirit. Not just diligent, getting the job done, but you should be fervent in your approach to life. Fervent in spirit. Uh, uh, the Greek word is interesting for fervency. It is zeo is the word, and it means to boil. You ever just sat a watch? You ever turned a, a pot on a stove, turned it on and watched it? Does it boil if you're staring at it? Seems like never, but it eventually boils. And when you see that boiling pot, that's a spiritual illustration of yourself. That's the way you should be spiritually, like just bubbling over with excitement for God. I mean, I had a friend of mine in seminary who preached a sermon on the, no, the joy of knowing Jesus. And it was, it was the most sad thing you've ever seen. It was like, I want to speak today about the joy of Jesus in my life. It's wonderful. It's exciting. You're like, it was a funeral. Get on with it. Fervency of spirit, bubbling over with the joy of God. There's two ways to take this term, fervency of spirit. You can say it can denote a person who's totally enthusiastic for God. I mean, they are like turned on for God. I knew a missionary one time in the Philippine Islands. He and his family, his two kids and his wife, went and assigned themselves to a, 
a tribal group, followed them around for seven years. They would go home on furlough, come back. The tribe would never say goodbye, never welcome them back. They would just find where they were next and kind of move back in. He said it was seven years before he got his first convert to Christ. I'm thinking to myself, I think I would have given up after a year. What did this guy have with his family? Fervency of spirit. He got his first convert, and then he got five converts, then he got 10, then he got 15, then he got 20. But he stuck with it. Why? He was on a call from God. He had fervency of spirit. Do you have that? Well, you might say to yourself, well, I, I, I can't have that fervency of spirit because I am a, I'm an ESTJ. Huh? Or I am a ISTJ. And, you know, my wife is an ESTP, and my son is an ISTP, and my daughter is an ESFJ, and I think our dog is an ESFP, and, and on and on and on it goes. I mean, do you know what your psychology type is? You don't? Okay, I do. And I, I got it. I mean, I'm an, I'm an introvert with an extrovert job. I mean, you got to be kidding me. And so you, if you have that kind of life, you can't just say, I'm going to hide behind my psych psychological profile. God says, I don't care how you're wired, you can be on fire for me. The second way you can interpret this is, not just personal joy in following Christ, but, but being filled with the Spirit. Because when he says fervency of Spirit, there's the article before the word Spirit. An article is the word the. So read it this way. Fervency of what? The Spirit. Oh, that's different. What's that mean? That, that you're full of the Spirit of God. You know the qualitative difference between somebody who's got the Spirit of God about them and someone who does not. Because you can see it in preachers, can you not? It's like, that was the most boring thing I have ever heard. Or, I am so on fire, I gotta do something. When I was in a, a college in, uh, from 76 to 80 at Azusa Pacific in LA, uh, they would have different pastors come and preach uh, to the student body. And you had to go to chapel, Christian school. And so we'd go. And I heard all kinds of speakers in four years. I heard Chuck Smith when he was first starting out. Great man of God. Uh, he, he was full of the spirit of God. And, and then I heard Evie Hill. Do you know who Evie Hill is? Oh, my goodness. The man can bring it. He, he showed up one day, and he's on stage. He came out, and he pulled out a hanky. I'm like, what's that for? It ain't hot in here. Oh, he was getting ready to get going. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? And they're like, like halfway through what he's saying during his sermon, he's all into it. And you're like, I'm so pumped up. It's like, I got to go do something for God. And then he would stop in the middle of a sermon. He'd go, I just got a word. You see a phone? <laughs> Who's talking to him? He got a word from God, right? That he needed to say something directly to the student body. We were listening and we were 17 years old. What was so great about his preaching? The Spirit of God was about his preaching. I mean, I had Tony Evans as a, as a professor in 1981. You know Tony Evans? Same thing. One day he told us as a young man, he goes, men, he said, in your lifetime, you're going to shoot a lot of crooked arrows for God. But he said, just understand, God hits a target every time. I'm like, yes. See, that's the spirit anointed stuff. So he said, be fervent in your spirit. So be excited about your faith and be appealing to the spirit of God to fill your vessel with his power for living. And if that's all true in your life, if you're asking for all that, it logically follows that you serve him. That's the last thing he says. He says you should be serving, present tense participle. You should be serving who? Lord. You should be serving the Lord. That just should be what you do. You serve the Lord. But where? Wherever he puts you. The Greek word here is, is, is based on the word doulos, which means to be a slave. That the minute you became a Christian, you're no longer a slave to sin. You're now a slave to Christ, and he is your master. He's your Lord, and whatever he wants is what you do. So today is Darren's last day, is it not? But he's a slave of Christ. So is Lisa. So are the kids. What are they doing? They're doing what God wants them to do because he told them, opened the door for them, sold their house in a day, and he opened the door to send them to Texas. You think we like it? No. <laughs> but I, but I, loved, I loved God's leadership. So what do, what do other slaves of Christ do? We turn loose our brother and his family and we say, God, use him to your glory and we'll trust you to fill in his shoes, but we're just slaves following the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that you? You serving Christ and following him no matter where he takes you? That's the kind of saints we need to be. That's what our culture's looking for. Let's pray. God, we want to be sold out to you that our lives have all these qualities about them and show us how to do that because I'm sure we have many points of leakage and so fill us with the Spirit. Empower us to follow hard after you. 
And may our families, our relationships, just uh, drip with the, the love that's in these words to your glory. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you.